Bite. Today's next session is dedicated to our student interns. As you may know, one of our center's aim is to train future public health entomologists. The intern program has been a great mechanism to connect academia and vector control agencies, as well as train students along the way. Here to present their experiences are our three 2020 summer interns, Linda Wolf from Oklahoma University, Taylor Ludwig from University of Arkansas Monticello, and Macy Lively, Lively from Texas A&M University. Please remember to hold your questions until the end of the session, and you can go ahead and share your screen, Linda. Okay, how's it look? Awesome, we can see hey. it. Awesome, well, good afternoon. My name is Linda Wolf. Before I begin, I just like to point out that I've reserved the top right corner of the slide for you to put the active speaker video if you would like. I graduated from the University of Oklahoma in May, 2020 with my bachelor's in biology. And this past summer, I had the honor of being the intern chosen to work for the Western Gulf Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Diseases with my esteemed mentor, Dr. Heather Ketchum. This internship was carried out at OU in partnership with Oklahoma State University and the Oklahoma City County Health Department. At the beginning of the summer, my email inbox was flooded with emails from professors and professionals in the field. One of those professors was Dr. Bruce Noden, and he emailed me and wrote, all you have to do is think like a tick. Today, my goal is to take you through the guide to becoming a tick collector, how one, thinks to, how one learns to think like a tick, and how my summer internship at the Western Gulf Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Diseases helped shape the path I'm on today. So first, I'd like to start with my guide to becoming a tick collector. In the beginning, I didn't know anything about ticks. I had taken a forensic etymology class along with using arthropods as my subject to study for my senior capstone project, but neither one of these courses looked at ticks. I dove straight into literature reviews. The literature taught me about anatomy, life stages, common species that I would find in the, re in the region, how to design my research project, and even a little bit about how to sweep and collect for ticks. OSU lent us their tick trapping materials, and Dr. Noden even gave us a special demonstration on how to sweep, explaining that it was far superior to tick drags for our region's vegetation. Before I could get underway on my project, I had to find a location, I had to find a location to survey. I drove all across the city looking for the perfect place, but I ended up getting on the internet and looking at hiking and trail reviews, searching for anybody that mentioned ticks. This led me to Lake Arcadia. Lake Arcadia is located in Edmond, Oklahoma. It's surrounded by three state parks, Central State Park, Edmond Park, and Spring Creek Park. And it has a multi-use trail that spans 6.7 miles connecting all three parks. This multi-use trail is pet friendly and accessible to bikers and pedestrians. The popularity of the trail in the community, along with the surrounding forest and presence of wildlife, made this the perfect location to survey. Now that I had my location and we had our materials, we were ready to hit the field. But you don't know what the field's like until you're actually in the field. Step one to my guide, evolution of the fit. Of course, I was told how to dress for the field. I was supposed to wear light colored clothing, long sleeves, long pants, tuck my pants into my socks, wear a hat and boots. I started with a pair of leggings, a Magellan fishing top, a Magellan fishing top that I already owned, hiking boots, and no hat because I don't like the way I look in hats. Well, this quickly went south. <laughs> I was covered in ticks every single day around my ankles, shoulders, and back. So I switched things up a bit. I swapped out my hiking boots for my old pair of military boots and I found a hat. But every day I would still be covered in tick bites. They'd find their way underneath my layers no matter how much tucking or taping I did. So what was I supposed to try next? One of our volunteers said it best. Trey, who works with the Oklahoma City County Health Department said, I knew I was in trouble when I saw Dr. Ketchum. Dr. Ketchum wears a set of coveralls with tall rubber boots and a long sleeve hiking shirt. And of course she wears a hat. She had the least amount of tick bites every day. So I hopped onto Amazon and I bought myself a pair of coveralls and I never looked back. This combo of long sleeves, 
onesie and hat became the most effective way to prevent tick bites for the rest of my summer. Towards the end of the summer, by the time my outfit had been perfected, I walked past a group of women on the trail and overheard one of them say, wow, she looks official. But it wasn't just the coveralls that stopped the ticks. Number two to the guide, no pain, no gain. To no one's surprise, there are more than just ticks outside in nature. To be, a tick, to be a tick collector, you must be willing to let your subjects, as well as other insects, crawl all over you and potentially bite you. Loving the outdoors and all the outdoor residents is necessary to being a collector. And while I'll be honest, at the beginning of the summer, I didn't exactly think duct tape would help that much. We all learned the importance of taping our ankles and wrists and how it could prevent, help prevent tick bites, as well as hold anything together. Next thing all good tick collectors must have is stamina. The average temperature at Arcadia Lake this summer was 82 degrees Fahrenheit with highs around 97 and an average relative humidity of 70%. We would collect ticks from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. This made for extremely long and hot days, not to mention sometimes unexpected thunderstorms would quickly roll overhead and we'd have to gather up all, our all of our materials and run back to the car, which could potentially be miles away. As the day went on and the temperatures climbed, setting those CO2 tra traps got more and more exhausting. We would crawl through the smallest spaces, sometimes even following little deer trails that went through these pokey, dense tree branches, just looking for the perfect place to set our CO2 traps. We even lost a few volunteers to heat-related illness this summer. Once eager to volunteer their help, some students just stopped replying to my texts. Snacks and water are definitely encouraged for all days spent in the field. Number four, public interaction. You may think no one will bother you while you're out in the field. Nobody likes ticks. People think ticks are gross. And if you thought this like me, you'd be wrong. People love asking what you're doing. And when you tell them that you're collecting ticks, they get even more excited. <laughs> Every cyclist you meet will make a joke about offering you their ankle so you can collect ticks from their socks. Everyone with a dog will offer you their dog so you can collect ticks from it. And while I didn't take either offer for my tick collections, I made sure to pet all the dogs I met. Every time we were in the field, there was an opportunity to speak to the public. And the public's interest and genuine gratitude for what I was doing made me even more excited about the work that I was doing. I'm even in the process of developing a small handout with important information about the project, project partners, and important facts about ticks, so I have something to give all those people I interact with. Last and certainly not least, the most important part of being a tick collector is to have fun with it. Yes, it was hot and humid, the trail was long, and the tick bites were very itchy but every day you have to find a reason to laugh and have fun with what you're doing. Early in the summer and early on the trail, we started to notice some blackberry bushes along the edge. Every now and then we would pick a berry, eat it, and then continue on with our collections. One day we were lucky enough to end at a rather large blackberry bush and we had some leftover dry ice in our cooler. So we picked some berries, put it into the ice container, and let it freeze for a few minutes. That way we got to enjoy frozen blackberries before driving home that day. I even came back to this location with a, <laughs> with a bag and I collected as many berries as I could find. Took them home and I made a small pie, <laughs> now known as the lone berry pie. This is my complete guide to becoming a tick collector. Hopefully you'll learn from it, but like I said, you just don't know what the field is like until you're in the field. So after all that time in the field, what did I find? This summer, I collected 2,104 ticks, and this number only includes adults and nymphs. There are still hundreds more larvae ticks collected and sitting in my lab waiting to be counted. I designed a two-fold research project. First, I wanted to know the risk of encountering a questing tick. To do this, I did sweeps along the edge of the trail in 15 meter sections. Second, I wanted to know overall abundance of ticks at the lake, and for abundance, I set CO2 traps 15 meters off of the trail every 100 meters down the trail. All ticks were collected in 70% ethanol and shipped to UTMB for pathogen analysis. We spent a total of 21 days in the field and 34 days in the labs, in the lab. 
Volunteers were hard to come by, but we had seven amazing people in total come out and help work on the project, which ran from June to August. This is a graph of the total number of adults and nymphs collected at Lake Arcadia broken down in this species. Of the 2,104 ticks at Lake Arcadia, we found three species. 99% were Amblyoma americanum, which is the Lone Star tick. Less than 1% was Amblyoma maculatum, the Gulf Coast tick. And less than 1% was Dermacenter variabilis, the American dog tick. The Lone Star tick was by far the most abundant at the lake. Here I've broken down the life stages collected and the sex collected. As you can see, we collected three times as many nymphs than adults and nearly two times as many females than males. So after sorting the ticks by species, life stage and sex, they were then shipped to UTMB. The lab at UTMB ran a molecular panel on the ticks that included anaplasma, Ehrlichia chaffiensis, Ehrlichia uini, spotted fever group rickettsia, which was then sequenced if positive. Tests not, not run yet are Borrelia, Heartland virus, and Bourbon virus. Due to COVID, testing samples from the summer have been delayed. However, I do have some preliminary data from the first 77 pools of ticks. Of the tests completed, we have percent positive pools separated into pathogens. Pools of adult ticks contain one to 10 ticks and pools of nymphs contain 20 ticks. Close to 50% of all pools tested were positive for spotted fever group rickettsia. Then from those positive pools, then from those positive pools, 80 to 100% were, 80 to 100% were sequenced and identified for, as rickettsia amblyommatis. It's unclear if rickettsia amblyommatis causes disease in humans. However, there are ongoing studies with with rickettsia and its correlation to disease. Lastly, we see that 20% or fewer of the ticks analyzed were positive for Ehrlichia uini, which is known to cause illness in immunocompromised patients. I'd also like to point out that there was one male amblyoma maculatum, which was positive for spotted fever group. This is interesting because out of the two ticks collected, we already have 50% verified to contain potential pathogens. Now, I'd like to highlight one of my most favorite takeaways from the internship, TikToks. <laughs> this is what I call our bi-weekly meeting, our bi-weekly tick meeting, which is hosted by Dr. Boyer at UTMB. This meeting started as a way to work out some shipping questions and concerns and has since evolved into a multi-state collaboration of tick professionals across the United States. These meetings gave me an opportunity to see into the lab where the ticks were being sent meet professionals in the field, and learn about different areas, of, different areas of study involving ticks. I have met so many different people, all who have welcomed me to the table and included me from the very beginning. Being included in these meetings gave an overall purpose to the whole internship and allowed me to view the bigger picture of the project. The opportunities that have since, the opportunities, opportunities that have opened since this internship ended have been countless. The project has actually been extended for the fall and spring semester, which I'm very excited about. I get to go back into the field and continue collecting ticks. And this time I'm hoping to find a little more variation. Hopefully Ixodes scapularis, the black legged tick will be out there this winter. We've also been working with the Oklahoma City County Health Department on adding some cool new tick information to their Fight the Bite website. All of these experiences combined made me realize that I'd like to go to graduate school, and I'm happy to say that I'm currently applying to Masters of Public Health programs. After reflecting on such a memorable summer, I'd like to summarize my experience with this. Being in the field is like being on the front line of research, collecting dangerous vectors for pathogen analysis to evaluate the risk for tick-borne disease and, develop, and to help develop improved tick bite protection and awareness for our community. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone at the Western Gulf Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Diseases for making this internship possible. The partnership with the University of Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University, and the Oklahoma City County Health Department. To all the volunteers who spent part of their summer with me and the OU Bazell Library staff, thank you. Awesome presentation, thank you, Linda.
All right, um, next up we have Taylor Ludwig. Um, Taylor, if you can share your video and then share your screen. Okay, how's that? Is that working? Yes, perfect. Okay. Is that all set up? Yep, you're good to go. All right. Then. Hey, everybody. My name is Taylor Ludwig. I'm a senior at the University of Arkansas in Monticello. I am currently a double major in biology and biochemistry. This summer, I spent collecting ticks uh, with the Western Gulf Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Diseases, uh, led by one of my own professors here at UAM, Dr. Keith Blunt, with assistance of another student here named Ty Say. Uh, I would like to begin this presentation first by noting how there is a national trend and an increase of tick-borne diseases throughout the United States. As seen here in this graph that I found on the CDC website, since 2004, there's been a steady increase up until 2017 with a peak of 60,000 reported cases in the United States. Now, Arkansas is not really represented well within this data, um, has not been thoroughly surveyed, and currently there is no entomologist working for the Arkansas Department of Health. So for 2020, all the data revolving ticks and tick-borne diseases actually came from us through this internship. In Arkansas, there are several common diseases that are transmitted through ticks. The most common disease is the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is transmitted by Dermacenter variabilis, followed by ehrlichiosis, which is transmitted by Ambiona americanum. And as we will see later in this presentation, the Lone Star Tick has a very strong population within Arkansas. Thirdly, uh, there's a new virus being reported going around called the Heartland virus, and is believed to be transmitted by the Lone Star Tick. Um, it has been found in Arkansas and is reported to cause flu-like symptoms. According to Pastula et al., this virus can cause hospitalization and even death in humans. So if this is a new virus that's starting to be spread around Arkansas, that's something that should be kept an eye on. Additionally, Amblyonna maculatum has been increasing its geographic range away from the Gulf Coast, making its way up here into Arkansas. This raises concern because the Gulf Coast tick is a known carrier for Rickettsia parkeri, which is a human pathogen. So in order to get a better understanding of the distribution of ticks and tick-borne diseases in Arkansas, we had to go out and collect the specimen. We did this through two main methods, flagging and traps. Majority of our ticks were collected through flagging. Uh, it was a very easy process, uh, but it required a lot more work than traps. Uh, unfortunately, we did not have a lot of access to dry ice, so we could not use the traditional dry ice traps. Um, but my assistant, Ty Say, took it upon himself to see if he could overcome this obstacle. So on this image on this screen on the right is a type of trap that Ty created using baking soda and vinegar, your classic volcano chemistry experiment, to produce carbon dioxide in order to lure in ticks for the trap. Now, we tried this throughout several of our locations, um, but unfortunately, it did not work out that well. We, a few sites we were able to pick up maybe one or two ticks using this trap, um, but it just did not really seem to work that well. There were a couple locations where we were able to use dry ice. So we compared dry ice traps to these vinegar traps to see if there was any difference at all. And it did seem that the dry ice traps worked a lot better than these vinegar traps. So there is potential for these vinegar traps to work, but it's just the way that we did it didn't work out too successfully. Um, using these methods, we surveyed several different habitats throughout Arkansas. We were trying to see if we could find any correlation between habitat and a species of tick or even the tick-borne diseases in that area. We traveled all over Southeast Arkansas. I think it was around 1,400 miles over the 11 week period. And we spent hundreds of hours out in the field surveying the sites. Um, some of these sites that we surveyed had the same locations and some of them, or same habitats, excuse me, and some of them had unique habitats. So for example, we surveyed this one location called Roth Prairie Natural Area, and it was actually a square mile 
uh, protected land in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by rice fields as far as you can see. And we actually were able to collect some ticks there. So that was enough proof to me that you can't really hide from the ticks. They're everywhere. Shown on this slide are three of the main types of habitats that were most common throughout the sites that we surveyed. Um, on the left is a photograph I took at one of the sites near Monticello. It was an open grass field. And usually when we found these grass fields, they were bordered by some type of pine or hardwood forest. So when I set up my transects, when I was surveying this area, I try to have some of the transect within the forest area and some of it out in the open field to see if there's any difference there. Usually we did not collect a lot of ticks at these locations. And if we did, they were usually in the edge of the transect by the forest. Another habitat that was common is this kind of prairie habitat shown in this middle image. And that is the Kingsland Prairie natural area. So this type of habitat, the plant growth does not get mowed down every so often. So it was able to grow taller. And because of that, it allowed more opportunity for ticks to hide out during the day and hide from the heat to prevent being desiccated. So we found a lot more ticks in that habitat than we did in the open grasslands. However, the majority of our ticks came from the habitat seen on the right which is uh, is basically like a grassland forest habitat where there was patches of grass within a, a dense foresty area. That particular site, Cane Creek Lake, um, was a very ticky area for us. We collected over 500 ticks in one day, um, which was a remarkable sight to see. I was standing there in one location and I looked down and there was probably 100 ticks crawling up my legs. Uh, so after surveying all these different sites, it became very obvious that there were environmental factors that played a big role on whether ticks would be present or not. Um, and it really comes down to host availability, but more so light exposure and temperature. So in the Cane Creek area, the habitat with the mixed grass and forests, there was a lot of tree cover. And that tree cover allowed uh, or, or kept the, the habitat nice and cool during the day, which allowed more ticks to be spending more time questing. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the more during our collecting periods, the time of the day was also an important factor. So when we went out and collected earlier in the morning when it was nice and cool, we were able to find that there were warm more ticks that were being collected versus later in the day when it warmed up and uh, those ticks would go down and hide from the desiccation. Alternatively, this image on the screen on the left is of the Longview Saline Natural Area. So we surveyed a couple of sites, including that one, where we did not collect any ticks. And as you can see in that image, uh, might be a little hard to see, but there were puddles of water everywhere and it had been previously burned. So even though it had a lot of that tree cover, just was not a suitable environment at the time for tick species. So at the conclusion of our quest for ticks, we totaled 830. Um, right away, it was very clear that Amblyonia americanum was the most prevalent species of tick uh, they accounted for 95% of all the ticks that we collected. We were able to find some Amblyonia maculatum. Um, and from the shipment that we have had analyzed so far, we did get positive results for Ketsia parkeri, um, which I found to be interesting because those ticks were collected on my campus, which raises concern because, you know, it's just right there in your backyard. And we only did get 28 species or 28 individuals of Dermacenter variabilis. I was expecting to find more American dog ticks because in Arkansas, the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is the most reported tick disease. And uh, the numbers didn't really make sense to me if there's only 28, but it's the most commonly reported disease. So as you see on the right here on this graph, so that's our first shipment of ticks that we were able to get analyzed. Unfortunately, because of COVID, uh, everything's been put on, getting put on pause. So we're waiting for more results to come back but we were able to find that these ticks contain Ehrlichia chaffiensis and Ehrlichia uingii, which are known human causing pathogens. Um, an interesting discovery that we saw was that the, major, the highest infection rate percentage came from Rickettsia amblyommatis, which is not known to cause human disease. Um, I believe that that played a role in why the Lone Star ticks are not really spreading disease around as much because 
amniomatis has been shown to inhibit the acquisition of Rickettsia parkeri. So as amniomatis gets introduced into a population and as it starts getting spread around to those ticks, it's actually preventing Rickettsia parkeri from getting spread around. So in a study done by Carpathy et al., they found that locations with a high population of Lone Star ticks that had high rates of Rickettsia amniomatis, there was a decreased amount of reported cases of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So that goes to show you that amniomatis may play a role in the levels of infections and reported cases. That present, or that concludes my presentation. I'd like to give a special thank you out to these several people, um, particular Dr. Boyer for supporting this internship, Caroline Weldon for helping with all the paperwork and making sure that everything I have is turned in on time, and Nicole Mandel for doing all the hard work and actually figuring out if the ticks we collected had any diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Great presentation. All right, up next we have Macy Lively for our last student presentation. Macy, if you could share your video and then share your screen, please. All right, hi everyone. Um, give me one second. All right, is that working? We do not see your presentation yet. Okay. Sorry, it's saying it's sharing the screen. Um, yeah, I see that. Um, do you see your presentation? I do. Um, oh, well, you know what? Actually, Taylor, I think that you're still sharing your screen. So if you could stop sharing your screen. There we go. <laughs> all right, is it working now? Yeah, we're good. Thank awesome, you. okay. Um, all right, so um, hi, my name is Macy Lively and I'm currently a Master of Public Health student at Texas A&M. And my journey into public health has been uh, a little bit unexpected. Uh, I originally was studying national security and diplomacy for my master's in international affairs and doing Arabic at the Bush School of Government, um, but I stum stumbled into a pandemic course as an elective um, and just fell in love with studying diseases and thought it was so interesting. So I ended up graduating with a concentration in pandemic policy and biosecurity policy. And who would have thought a, a couple years later that would be um, playing out in real time. So um, that was really interesting. And shortly after graduation, I started working on a, a book, co-authoring it with one of my professors, Dr. Blackburn. Um, and we were looking at neglected tropical diseases in the rural, rural southern United States. Um, and a lot of my work was focused on uh, the policies and socioeconomic conditions that were causing these diseases. Um, but what I was finding was when I was really getting into literature uh, and trying to understand uh, these diseases, I didn't understand most of the articles that I was reading. And so uh, really wanting to get a better grasp of that, I, I went back to study um, epidemiology. And so that's where I under, uh, ended up where I am now. And uh, I found the opportunity to do this internship with the Western Gulf Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Diseases and was extremely interested to learn more about some of the vector-borne diseases I had been reading about. Uh, so again, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, that being said, I had, uh, similar to Linda, not a ton of experience, almost none, especially with mosquito identification and RTQ-PCR. Uh, so a huge thanks uh, to Trey Williams and Dr. Franza, who I worked with at Southern Nazarene University for their patients and um, just a lot of their guidance while I, while I had that pretty steep learning, learning curve. Um, so the first thing was uh, I'm a student in Texas and I read a lot about uh, mosquitoes in Texas, but uh, when I found out about the internship in Oklahoma, I was like, okay, so what's the situation in Oklahoma? And I quickly learned that Oklahoma is a very important sentinel location for mosquito-borne disease surveillance. Uh, one, because of its proximity to Texas uh, and its exposure to invasive species through different uh, travel and trade, um, and also the location of the central flyway zone and all the migratory birds that come through and how mosquitoes feed on those migratory birds and then feed on the local passerine birds and then how that disease can be passed on to humans. Um, and also Oklahoma had experienced 
three major outbreaks of West Nile virus already, uh, including like 814 clinical cases and 58 deaths. Uh, so that's why most of the research that I did at Southern Nazarene University and uh, the Oklahoma City County Health Department focused on West Nile. Uh, so my first objective uh, was just to collect the mosquito data from uh, for Southern Nazarene University and the Oklahoma City County Health Department. And this just involved doing the mosquito trapping efforts and species identification and then running the arboviral assays. Um, so similar to Linda, I pretty quickly learned that long sleeves were very important and so were pants. Uh, luckily, I didn't have to deal with any tick bikes, um, but the mosquitoes were pretty aggressive. Uh, so I quickly learned how to operate the different traps. That was probably one of the most interesting aspects was just how much time can be spent into troubleshooting the different motors and the wires and how much time is spent just upkeeping the traps because uh, you're only as, as your analysis is only going to be as good as the data you're able to literally catch. Uh, so learning about the different types of traps, there's the GAT trap that uh, what typically would catch a lot of uh, 80s mosquitoes, but for whatever reason this year, we had some technical difficulties with that one and some pesticides. So uh, we didn't include that one in a lot of our results, uh, but also the CDC light trap, uh, which caught a lot of uh, 80s and Anopheles mosquitoes. And then the gravid trap, which as expected over here on the left side, caught a lot of cool X. So we were really just trapping in several locations that had already been trapped at previously. Uh, different private residences and urban and suburban areas, uh, but then also in like equestrian centers or uh, wildlife refugees in different places that really just kind of covered the whole spectrum of the Oklahoma City metro area. All right, and then this just kind of shows uh, something that I found interesting. So while I was like trapping the mosquitoes along with the other um, Southern uh, summer interns, uh, I wasn't just managing the 2020 data, but it was also going back and looking at the 2018 and 2019 data as well and kind of cleaning that and managing it and getting it to where we could really compare uh, through different analyses how the mosquito ecology and abundance and diversity are changing throughout the years, especially in some of these places that we've been able to trap at for multiple years in a row. Um, and so what's interesting is, as you can see on the left, for the first year in 2018, I believe only two CDC lights uh, were used, and it was primarily 80s that were caught, uh, mostly 80s vexins. And then the second year, um, I believe it was five CDC lights, and then two gravids were introduced into the mix. And so you could see how um, it caught both the 80s and the cool X and the gravid. And then in 2020, it was not just the five CDC lights, but we also introduced five gravids as well. So you can really see how. Um, the species diversity changed, or the, the genus diversity changed as the different types of traps that were used for these trapping events uh, were changed up as well. And so the next thing that I learned was how to sort and classify the different mosquitoes by morphology. Um, so typically that involved as soon as we would catch them and bring them into the lab at Southern Nazarene, we would freeze them for about 30 minutes in the um, minus 20 freezer. And then once they had all stopped moving around and we were sure that we weren't gonna have any surprises, uh, we would put them in the um, Anadora dis dissection microscope uh, and we'd be able to sort out the mosquitoes from the non-mosquitoes. And so you can see kind of here what that process looked like. We had an 80s albopictus that we were separating out from some other bugs. Uh, and then we separated the males from the females and then we separated by genus. Uh, and so at Southern Nazarene, we used the Darcy and Ward key and what that looked like is like the step one would just be look, looking for identifying features of the, mis, uh, of the genus. So for Anopheles, the palps were in this mosquito, you can see uh, just as long as the proviscus. And so that kind of cued me in, okay, it's, it's probably an Anopheles mosquito. And then I'd take a closer look at the wings. And here in the key from the Darcy and Ward, you can see how um, vein C with the apical and the subcostal pale spots are very pronounced both here and here. And so I would be able to say, okay, that's an Anopheles punct penis mosquito. Um, so that's really important because by understanding the different uh, mosquito species that we were working with and that were present in the different areas, uh, we could gain a better understanding of their ecology and also how um, each mosquito might be contributing to how different diseases were being uh, spread as far as the driver goes, um, but also just get a better picture of what the species distribution looked like. 
and this was really interesting as well. So this was just from 2020 data, but these are the five sites that we, we tested that had the five highest minimum infection rates for West Nile. And so you can see how um, for the equestrian center where there were horses around, we caught a lot of um, Sorophora columbiae and the Sinensis tours. We didn't really catch that as much in other areas. Uh, in the two urban traps, we caught a lot of colics, um, again, to be as expected because it was a very residential uh, area and there were domesticated mosquitoes. And then the wildlife refuge, which is inland, inland floodwaters, which is where uh, Anopheles mosquitoes really thrive. We can see we caught a lot of Anopheles mosquitoes there, as well as a lot of 80s albopictus. And then this fifth site was kind of unique because not only was it uh, a residential area in like a suburban, but it was also kind of bordered another area with like horse and cattle and also some ponds and more wooded areas. So we kind of caught the most diverse um, trap was this one. It, it caught a little bit of everything. Um, so that was really interesting to see as well, just how the different sites re really reflected that different um, biodiversity. And then as soon as we were able to sort the mosquitoes, we went ahead and moved on to the arboviral assays. And um, again, I had a lot of uh, thanks to Dr. Franza for his patience uh, as I learned uh, for the first time how to use the micropipette. And that involved a few days of uh, practicing on water before he would let me move on to the assays. Uh, but I'm very glad that I was able to learn from that. Um, so the first thing that we would do is we would take the mosquitoes with the DNA and RNA shield and um, homogenize them with a 3D printed mobile bead beater. And so this pr uh, process and the DNA RNA extraction process would get that sample ready for the RTQ PCR analysis. And so using that, uh, we were able to analyze two, uh, a total of 250 pools using virus-specific primers. And out of those 250 pools, uh, 11 of them tested positive for panflavivirus. And for um, panalphavirus, 22 tested positive. And then out of the 11 that had tested positive for uh, flavivirus, 64% of them also tested positive for West Nile. And then seven tested positive for panbunia virus. And so another thing that was uh, really cool is this was just the cutoff point um, right when we were starting to get ready to leave for the summer. So there were even more that we were able to test and get positive results on and run gels on, uh, but we're still waiting on, on getting all of those kind of compiled and then also finishing up testing from previous years so that we can do a, a more broad analysis of what that looks like from 20, um, 2018 to 2020. And this is just what one of those um, RTQPCR um, arboviral test looks like. I believe this is a uh, pan alpha virus. Yeah. And you, oh, there it goes. Um, and you can see how uh, the blue sample is the, the positive result. Uh, the red is the positive control and the green is the negative control. And then over here in the black is, is a sample that tested negative. So that's what those uh, arboviral assays looked like when we were able to get the results. And the uh, testing at the health department looked a little bit different. Um, instead of doing the molecular assays, we did a rapid immunochromatographic, immunochromatographic assay. Um, and then after we would do those assays and do the um, dipstick, which had the, positive, uh, which had the control, and then if it tested positive, it would have another line. Uh, if we did get a positive, we were able to take that to Southern Nazarene University and do a, a another molecular assay just with that sample. And that just really showed the value between the partnership between um, OCCHD and SNU uh, because uh, SNU was getting data that OCCHD was collecting that it wouldn't have access to otherwise. And uh, OCCHD was really benefiting from the extra resources that Dr. Franza has to do the molecular assays. Okay, and so um, my second objective was to elucidate how mosquito diversity and ecology influence the spread of arboviruses in Oklahoma just through the analysis of mosquito surveillance data. So that was kind of taking that 2018 to 2020 data. And here you can just see some of our preliminary analysis looking at the trapping weeks and how um, the, the minimum infection rates varied over time and how you can see the number of mosquitoes caught corresponds uh, with the minimum infection rates and the number of positive pools. Uh, but as we are continuing to clean and compile the data, we're, we're still wanting to plot that and look at other variables such as temperature, humidity, rainfall, trap type, 
Uh, also, I'm currently working on uh, putting some of this data into ArcGIS and being able to create maps looking at how some of the different um, like mosquito species uh, and looks when it's compared next to like different variables and temperatures. So uh, even just different socioeconomic conditions like household income. So we're definitely continuing the work. It didn't end this summer um, by any means, but this is just some of the initial findings. And something else that I just personally thought was really interesting was looking at the change in um, mosquito abundance and um, different species over the years, especially when we first started all the sins and then how especially Colix tarsales has really peaked in 2019. And then this year we had a really hard time finding any at all. Um, and just seeing the gradual rise of Colix pipians and, and things like that, and especially um, Sorophora columbia as well, just seeing that vast uptick there. And some of the um, data analysis that we did, uh, not just on the 2018 to 2020 Southern Nazarene MODSO data, but also uh, data collected from Oklahoma City County, and then also the, the federal data as well was to take all of that and compile it together in one large data set, which we're still working on, and run different regressions, such as this one, looking at the number of positive pools and the human cases in each county, uh, to just run two way ANOVA tests and complete different calculations, looking at like species specific MIR and maximum likelihood estimates. And lastly, um, something that I was really blown away by was OCCHD's community education efforts. And I learned so much from this, even though uh, again, it was COVID and I wasn't able to get out in the community as much as all of us would have liked. Um, just seeing the different resources and tools that they had was amazing. Uh, even down to, I'm not going to play it, but their ad, little advertisement, the fight, the bite with the very catchy jingle that I still can't get out of my head. Um, but most of all, I was really impressed by their Skeeter meter status. So instead of just the number of human cases coming out in the news, this provided a tool that's really easy to understand, very easy to read. Uh, but because data like minimum infection rate doesn't give a, a wide range of the threat of infection, and really just compiles all of that data into one really easy to understand tool for the public. And I was really impressed by that. And also just in person, one of the things that we were able to do was responding to stagnant water complaints. And these are pictures from some of the pools that we visited, which was a really uh, interesting experience and just watching Trey interact. And really, I, I had first expected it to be focused on like issuing citations and uh, things like that, which is a component of it, but it was mainly interested in making sure that those residents understood why it was important for them to uh, manage their, you know, water and and not to allow stagnant water to collect. But then also just really out of genuine concern, making sure that they had the resources to address the problem and and really de dealing with it with a, a community effort in mind. So that was really impressive as well. Um, and then lastly. One of my objectives was just to better understand how resources were shared, which is, I think, at the heart of what the West School Center of Vector-Borne Diseases does. So um, to me, what was the most impressive by far was the Vector-Borne Disease Toolkit at OCCHD, because that's geared toward providing those resources to other health departments and entities to better be able to address uh, mosquito-borne diseases in their communities. So even things like the Guide to Establishing and implementing a suitable vector-borne disease response plan at a local level from an emergency management standpoint was really interesting to read. Just all of these templates that are available to different entities to be able to use moving forward. Uh, so in conclusion, I just want to say again, a huge thank you, especially to Dr. Franza at Southern Nazarene University for hosting me during COVID, uh, especially coming from out of state. And then also Trey Williams at Oklahoma City County Health Department for everything I learned from y'all and, and for this opportunity because I'll definitely continue to use the knowledge moving forward. Awesome, thank you, Macy. Very impressive presentations from all of our interns. Um, so we will now move forward um, with a Q&A session for our student interns. Questions for Linda, Taylor, or Macy. No questions in the chat yet, so I'll start off. Um, a question for all three of the interns. Overall, what do you think was the most valuable experience um, 
of your internship moving forward in your career? I can, I can start if, if that's okay with the other interns. Uh, so for me, honestly, I think the most valuable part was the opportunity to meet everybody. Um, I, at the very end of my undergraduate degree, I jumped ship and decided not to pursue the path that I was on. And so I was left with, oh boy, what am I going to do next? I know what I like and I know what I don't like. And this internship really helped me figure out my next step. And so meeting all the professionals in the field and seeing all those different areas of research and um, the impact that everybody was having, uh, it's, it's really what confirmed my ideas about applying to a graduate program. And it's why I've chosen to pursue public health. Um, for this interview or internship, I definitely learned a lot from uh, about the perspective of field biology. And I thought it was a great way to experience um, a way to actually get out in their field and see what field biology is all about. And I also think that it's a great thing for uh, resumes uh, and it makes us more competitive for applications to graduate or master programs. So that was probably the biggest takeaway that I got from this internship. And for me, similar to Linda, it was really about getting out there and meeting everyone and then working in an interdisciplinary setting, um, especially coming uh, without a very strong entomology background or molecular biology background. Uh, it was a little intimidating, um, but just everyone was so welcoming and really taught me like the process of where to go and find resources that would help me learn and succeed. So it was very much a, a team effort. And that was the biggest part that I took away from it. Hey, it sounds like you guys um, had a lot of great experience. Um, we've got a question from Jonathan Hernandez for Macy while we have you, Macy. Um, the question is, I'm going to be collecting Aedes mosquitoes and just want to know why were light traps better for collecting Aedes aegypti? Hi, Jonathan. So part of it had to do with um, where we were placing the traps and where we already knew that uh, the different species were abundant. But just com in comparison to the gravid traps, the Coolex uh, mosquitoes were especially uh, drawn to the gravid traps, uh, looking for a place to oviposition their eggs. In comparison to the um, the CDC light traps or are for the mosquitoes that are looking for a blood meal because they're drawn in by that uh, CO2 that's being dispersed. Uh, so in that aspect, we typically did uh, draw in more 80s mosquitoes that were looking for a blood meal in those areas. Does that, hope that answers your question. We've also got a question in the chat uh, from Gabe, Dr. Hamer. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to comment on all of these interns. I'm impressed that they actually happened amid this pandemic. So that was impressive. Um, I'm curious if anybody had any comments I assume you guys had to, on the fly, make some adjustments to the game plan, and probably I. It looked based on the looks of the field work, you were in smaller groups or maybe by yourself, maybe at times to kind of deal with you know reduced risk for COVID. So, um, so yeah, if anybody had comments on that, and then Linda, I just I noticed on one of your pictures you had, maybe that was your. Uh, bites. You had bites or something. Were those ants or ticks? I didn't catch. You might have said. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Hi. So I don't think that they were ticks. They are not my ankles. <laughs> oh, okay. It was one of the volunteers. We think that they were chiggers, uh, but the bites were so bad that they ended up getting infected and he had to go and, you know, go and see a professional, a doctor. <laughs> for help with it. And he has not returned to the field. He has offered his time for lab and helping me identify ticks uh, once they're in ethanol. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, and uh, about the, the COVID. So uh, from my experience, I know that it was kind of up in the air right at the beginning. And I know Caroline could speak a little more to this, but it was like, uh, maybe we're going to get started. And then all of a sudden it was like, yes, yes, we are going to start this. And so it was very uh, quick Oh, uh, what does a tick look like? And then uh, we did keep our volunteer teams small. We all drove separately to the field. And then honestly, it was really just 
two to three people. And then if we were lucky, we'd have more than two to three people. But yes, very small teams out in the field uh, and just an interesting summer with COVID all around. I don't know if any, if either of the other two interns wanted to comment, but just um, to respond a little bit further about the COVID situation, um, as Linda said, they were very up in the air um, and we were thankful for these guys to be committed um, no matter what. And it was very touch and go with each university, with each situation and um, what the rules were. So also thank you to their advisors that were very workable and um, lots of communication. So um, we're very fortunate to have these guys. I think there were these were the three interns out of five that we had planned to have this summer. Um, the other two were not able to make it through um, just because of COVID and the restrictions. So um, thank you all for being so workable and wonderful um, throughout the summer and through COVID. Do we have any other questions, Dr. Roundy? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Hamer. I was done. No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> I'm not seeing any other questions or hands at the moment. Okay. We'll give it another minute or so, um, but our next um, presentation will be from Dr. Miles and I believe he's online. Um, uh, yes, I'm online. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear oh, you. If you'd okay, like to great. share your video, you're welcome to. Um, sure. I've got one more question for the intern since we have another couple of minutes. Yeah, of course. Um, if you were to give advice to someone in your shoes, whether that's in a master's program or undergrad, considering a uh, career in public health entomology, um, what would that advice be? I don't, I, I'll go ahead and go. Um, to me, it would just be to take every opportunity to talk to uh, as many people as you can, because every time I talk to someone from a different aspect, uh, serving in a different part of the career field or in public health in general, or I always take away something and that something's always something that I can uh, apply and better figure out uh, where I want to implement like my skill set. Uh, so that's personally uh, what's helped me. I can add to that. Uh, I definitely agree um, with what Macy said. And something that I thought was daunting at first is everybody would recommend, well, just email professors or uh, set up Zoom calls with other people and just ask them what they do. Uh, and I, I, you know, I was like, what? I can't just email people and ask them to Zoom with me and tell me about their career. But it's true, it works. Uh, and that's why I love those tick meetings, the tick talks that we have. Um, it's just given me an opportunity to meet all these people. And then, I mean, I've even met with Caroline and just asked her about her path. Um, so I think the best thing, uh, the best thing that I've done and what I would recommend to others is ask people about their own path and how they got to where they are. Uh, ask them about their career and their interests and just see like, hmm, do those things align with what I'm interested in? And uh, do I like that path? I mean, obviously you'll make your own path, but again, just kind of figuring out how everybody got to where they are helps you figure out the path that you want to take. Uh, I just want to add uh, on the Linda there that I think that when you're pursuing a career in uh, public health, I think that internships like this are important because that way it's just a small period of your time you're not dedicating to a full-on career, and that way this allows you to dip your toes in uh, to different type of topics and see what you do like and what you don't like. Because um, if you do an internship and you don't like it, at least there you know what you don't want to do with your career. And I think that's valuable information. I completely agree. I had an internship with the state health department in Utah when I was an undergrad and learned some careers that I definitely did not want to be going into. So that's a valuable experience as well. 